What do you know about the Knight of the Long Knives? Who was involved? And what were the consequences of this event? Let's find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. The events which would unfold on the 30th of June 1934 would be set into motion long before that night. Hitler and the Nazi party made a run for the presidency in 1932 during his first and only attempt at elected office. He announced his candidacy on the 22nd of February 1932 and was running against Paul von Hindenburg, the aging former field marshal credited for the major victory at the Battle of Tannenberg in the First World War. If Hitler was to win against a popular and politically established general, he would need to launch a massive political campaign. Hitler's ambition led him to rent an aeroplane in order to carry out the first ever political campaign to use aircraft to travel in order to speak to voters. Hitler flew across Germany with the help of former World War I pilot Hans Bauer, who would later become his personal pilot, to take his political message to the masses. On his initial campaign trail, Hitler visited 21 towns, while his partner in the Nazi party, Gregor Strasser, would give speeches on his behalf when Hitler was not available. Despite the political air campaign and Hindenburg's age, Hitler was soundly defeated in the runoff election that April. Despite winning the election, Hindenburg appointed a series of ineffective chancellors built upon a series of coalition governments. By the next election cycle, on the 6th of November 1932, the Nazis lost seats from the previous election, but remained the largest party bloc in the Reichstag. Even with pressure from Hitler, Hindenburg refused to give the Nazis control of the chancellorship, but his persistence did force Hindenburg to replace Chancellor Franz von Papen with a German military officer turned politician Kurt von Schleicher. His tenure as Chancellor was hardly noteworthy, except for one event. In an attempt to isolate Hitler from the Nazi party, von Schleicher offered Gregor Strasser the Vice-Chancellorship. This was an intentional act, as the honour of Vice-Chancellor was usually reserved for the head of the party and was meant to drive a wedge between the Nazi party and Hitler. Instead, Hitler was able to rally support and accused Strasser of treason against the party, forcing him to resign his seat in the Reichstag along with his other party positions. With von Schleicher's failure to be an effective chancellor, the only possible candidate left to form a government was to have Hitler assume the chancellorship, which he did on the 30th of January 1933. As the Nazis took power, hundreds of thousands flocked to their cause, including party groups such as the Sturmabteilung, who were better known as the Stormtroopers, Brown Shirts, or SA. This force was headed by former army captain Ernst Röhm, and it would be under his leadership that the SA would grow and enforce Nazi ideology, culture, and racial codes. As chief of staff for the Brown Shirts, it was his duty to uphold these virtues. Yet in spite of this, he was openly homosexual, a trait which many top Nazis despised. As a former army officer, Rom had many ambitions, one of which included building up the armed forces of the military. Yet the Treaty of Versailles limited the Reichswehr force to 100,000. No such limit applied to the brown shirts, as they were not officially a military force, but a sort of national guard with loyalties to the Nazi party. As Hitler took the chancellorship, the government was still operating under the Weimar Constitution, and his position was similar to the Prime Minister of Great Britain. He was allowed to form a cabinet, influence legislation, and implement government policies, while Hindenburg's position as president gave him authority over the army and declare martial law. Hitler would have to bide his time until he could act and fully take control over the government. And he wouldn't have to wait long. Hitler agreed not to pack the cabinets with Nazi party members, although this was unnecessary as they were effectively useless. As he became familiar with the formal procedures of the Reichstag, he tightened his control and lessened the number of meetings held. As part of this takeover, Hermann Goering, the Minister Without Portfolio and Prussian Minister of the Interior, removed 22 of the 32 chiefs of police in Prussia, replacing them with members from the SA or SS. It was also during this time Goering would name the SA as an auxiliary police force, giving them another level of authority. As this was occurring, Hindenburg dissolved the Reichstag, as Hitler did not have a working majority, setting new elections for the 5th of March 1933. A major event would occur before this new election, as on the 27th of February 1933 at 9.14pm, the Reichstag caught fire. Marinus van der Lubbe, a Dutch communist, was quickly apprehended, interrogated and admitted to starting the fire, which destroyed most of the interior of the building. Goering was furious, and immediately demanded action against the Communist Party, 
and so the Nazis began to arrest both Communist Party members along with Social Democrats and pacifists. In total, 3,000 individuals were rounded up and arrested as part of the Reichstag fire, further consolidating power. Hitler went to Hindenburg with an emergency decree to suspend the civil liberties of every German citizen. This meant the people no longer had the right to free speech, press, or the right to assembly. The citizens of Germany also lost the right to privacy, as property could be searched without a warrant, along with the addition of instituting the death penalty for minor offences. All of this occurred before the election, in which the Nazis received 44% of the vote, hardly a working majority. However, the other parties were considerably weaker and divided. On the 23rd of March 1933, Hitler went to the Reichstag with a special statute called the Law for Alleviating the Distress of People and Reich, which would make the Reichstag effectively useless, as their power would be transferred to the cabinet. On the following day, the Nazis opened Dachau concentration camp to hold political prisoners suspected of activities inimical to the state. The establishment of concentration camps would become a source of contention later between the SA and SS as part of their struggle for power and favour with Hitler. Hitler's grasp on Germany was essentially complete, as within two months he legally had become dictator. In April of 1933, Goering would establish a new branch of police, the Geheime Staatspolizei, or Gestapo, who acted in the political interest of the state. This secret police service would be used as an iron fist to smash resistance and enforce political ideologies. By the 2nd of May 1933, the SA, SS and the newly formed Gestapo would act on their new authority by raiding and seizing trade union offices, as officials were arrested and bank accounts were requisitioned. Yet while the Nazis cracked down on their opposition, the inner circle began to bicker amongst themselves over the spoils of victory. Upon the Nazis taking control, Ernst Röhm immediately leaped at the opportunity to increase his social standing and pressured Hitler to make him the Minister of Defence. Röhm also wished to replace the Reichswehr with the SA, which did not sit well with the old guard that remained within the military. This uneasiness would be solved, however, on the 11th of April 1934, as Hitler gained the allegiance of the military in exchange for dealing with Röhm's aggression towards them. The military had a reason to be suspicious, as by June of 1934 the SA had grown to a movement of three million men. Hitler and Rome would meet on the 4th of June 1934 in an ill-fated attempt to calm Rome's demand. Hitler couldn't control or dispose of Rome, like any of his other top Nazi officials, without serious opposition, as Rome had the might of the brown shirts behind him. While Hitler had always backed Rome during the dark days of the early Nazi party movement, now that he had procured a tedious position of power, the brutal tactics employed by the brown shirts were no longer needed since the momentum of the left-winged parties, such as the Communists and Social Democrats, had been crushed. Meanwhile, a coalition of top Nazi officials began creating a plan to remove Rome, which included Hermann Goering, Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich. The plot to remove Rome from the hierarchy began with Heydrich and Himmler. Himmler, once a close ally to Rome, had grown tired of him, and the trio worked tirelessly to fabricate evidence to convince Hitler that Rome had committed treason against the Nazi party. As a result of Goering and Himmler's power over different agencies, it enabled them to use the resources available to each organisation for the plot. The Gestapo and Sicherheitsdienst, Security Service or SD, would work hand in hand, fabricating the evidence to seal Rome's fate. While they were ensuring Rome and the brown shirt's downfall, they also created lists of other political opponents who would be dealt with at the same time as Rome with Heydrich being in charge of the master list. The evidence the secret police presented to Hitler stated France had paid Rome 12 million Reichmarks, or nearly 72 million US dollars, to incite a revolution against him. This could almost be believable, as Rome and many of his brown shirts subscribed to the ideology of continuous revolution, a trait which is often found on the left side of the political spectrum, more associated with the later political movement of Maoism. The brown shirts felt they had been cast aside since the Nazis had come to power and become dissatisfied under the new regime. This dissatisfaction had even come to the point where some Nazi officials had been attacked by members of the brown shirts in acts of political violence. The madness had to be put to an end. Hitler gave his consent to the elimination of Rome and the neutering of the brown shirts by dispatching all of their senior leadership in an operation sanctioned by Hitler and triggered by the code phrase, Colibri. 
As the final details were put into place, Rome and the SA disbanded for a summer vacation instead of their normal military exercises, with Rome travelling to the town of Bad Wiese to stay at the Hanselbauer Hotel. Hitler had requested that the SA leadership gather at the hotel for a meeting on the 30th of June 1934 as he would be visiting. Rome immediately called his senior officers to the hotel and ordered a banquet be prepared for Hitler, paying attention to his special vegetarian requirements. Unknowingly, Rome had brought all the fish into the net, and Hitler simply had to close it. Hitler departed Essen and joined Goebbels in Godsberg, where they would spend the night before heading to Bad Wiese on the 30th of June. Hitler would leave from Hangelar airfield in the early morning of the 30th to confront Rome and his senior staff. Many of the officials had been up late partying, drinking, playing games, and were still asleep as Hitler and his entourage of soldiers stormed the hotel. The soldiers went room to room with Hitler leading the charge as they dragged the officers from their bed and took them to Munich's Stadelheim prison. When they reached Rome's suite, he was shocked and confused why Hitler was there so early. Hitler informed Rome that he was under arrest and he was taken away with the rest of the SA High Command. SS soldiers waited at the Munich train station to arrest any straggling brown shirt leaders while Hitler joined the raid at the SA headquarters on the Brienne Strasse. At exactly 10am, Goebbels gave the code word, Olibri. This singular word would be the moment of no return, as the Gestapo and SS were unleashed on their prey. The numbers are disputed, but at least 100 people were killed, with some estimations being as high as 1,000 between the 30th of June and the 2nd of July, with an additional 1,100 taken into police custody, during what became known as the Night of the Long Knives. Many important non-SA members were murdered during the purge, including Reichswehr General Kurt von Schleicher, Gustav von Kahr, the Bavarian Chief of State, whom Hitler failed to convince to join him during the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, and finally Gregor Strasse, the former Nazi leader, forced out of the party after the earlier failed attempt to isolate Hitler. Some political opponents were hauled off to prison, while others were gunned down where they stood, such as General Kurt von Schleicher, who was killed in his house with his wife. There would be no trial for the accused, and the public rewarded Hitler with applause when he announced he had stopped an attempt to overthrow the government by the brown shirts, all while the person at which the Knight of the Long Knives was targeted was still alive, as Hitler had yet to make up his mind about what to do with his oldest ally in the movement. By the next day, on the 1st of July 1934, SS officials entered Rome's cell, gave him a pistol, and told him he had 10 minutes to kill himself, or they would execute him. Rome retorted, If I am to be killed, let Adolf do it himself. The SS officials did not hear a gunshot and re-entered the room to see Rome with his chest puffed out in defiance. They raised their pistols and fired multiple rounds into Rome, killing him outright. The Night of the Long Knives would be one of the final pieces to fall into place, securing Hitler's power, with the very last occurring when Hindenburg died on the 2nd of August 1934. His death would allow Hitler to combine the power of the presidency and the chancellorship, giving him full authority over Germany. As a result of the purge, the SA would be forced under the control of the Reichswehr, which would eventually become the Wehrmacht. There was hardly any media coverage about the purge as Goebbels censored the press. Though reports were allowed to state Rome had been removed as the head of the SA, along with other top leadership for debauchery and failing to accept consequences for his actions. In order to cleanse the image of the Nazi party, they attempted to remove as many references and images of Rome as possible, including early propaganda films which featured Hitler and Rome's close relationship. As a result of this effort, Rome would be nearly forgotten about, along with his contribution to the rise of the Nazi party. He served an instrumental part in organising the brutal street thugs which would beat down the political opposition, and once he stopped being useful, Hitler and the Nazis eliminated him as a threat, instead choosing new forms of terror in order to maintain control. You have been watching the History Chronicles. We'd love to know what you think of the Night of the Long Knives. Please let us know below, and if you enjoyed our video, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Also, if you'd like to support our work going forward, please visit our Patreon page. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles.